Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Thank you so much to Audible for sponsoring today's episode. For those of you who don't know, Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, business motivation, and also podcasts. They've recently launched their newest plan called Audible Plus. With Audible Plus, you get full access to their Plus catalog filled with thousands of select originals, audiobooks, and podcasts, and connects you to just amazing content. The best time to try it is now with their holiday offer, because for only four ninety a month for your first six months. This is a fantastic deal. And all you have to do to get it is visit audible.com slash Zibby, Z-I-B-B-Y, or text Zibby, Z-I-B-B-Y, to 500-500. Again, visit audible.com slash Zibby or text Zibby to 500-500. 500. I love Audible and listen all the time in my car and on walks. I recently finished searching for Sylvie Lee by Jean Kwok, also Small Animals by Kim Brooks, His Only Wife by Peace Medi, and also On All Fronts by Clarissa Ward. So those are four of my recent ones. Um, I hope you'll join me in checking out Audible, audible.com slash Zibby, or text Zibby to 500-500. Did I say that enough times? Hope Edelman has been writing, speaking, and leading workshops and retreats in the bereavement field for more than 25 years. She was 17 when she lost her mother to breast cancer and 40 when her father died, events that inspired her to offer grief education and support to those who cannot otherwise receive it. Her first book, Motherless Daughters, was a number one New York Times bestseller and appeared on multiple bestseller lists worldwide. Her work has been translated into 14 languages and published in 11 countries. She is the author of seven additional nonfiction books, including Motherless Mothers and the memoir, The Possibility of Everything. She was the recipient of the 2020 Community Educator Award from the Association for Death Education and Counseling and has won a Pushcart Prize for her creative nonfiction. In addition to writing and speaking, she is a certified Martha Beck life coach and leads nonfiction workshops to help writers tell, revisit, and revise their stories of loss. She lives and works in Los Angeles and Iowa City. Her most recent book, which we're going to speak about today, is called The After Grief, Finding Your Way Along the Long Arc of Loss. Welcome, Hope. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss The After Grief, which I'm trying to show here, Finding Your Way Along the Long Arc of Loss. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much, Zibby. Would you mind please telling listeners what your latest book is about and what inspired you to write it? Yes. Well, my first book and several of my books were about early mother loss. So I wrote a book about the long-term effects of losing a mom when you're a child, teenager, or young adult, because that was my story. I was 17 years old when my mother died of breast cancer, and there were no books for girls like me or adults like me who had lost a mom when she was young, when she was younger. And, but then over the years, I, you know, started living more into my own experience. And I discovered that even decades later, this early loss was still coming up for me in new and different ways. Some that I could anticipate or expect and others that just blindsided me. And at that point, I knew lots of women in the motherless daughters community and I'd met a number of their brothers and I had a lot of friends who had lost fathers or siblings and they were telling the same story that the experience of grief was much more protracted and in fact extended over a lifetime in some ways. So that's how the after grief came about. That's what I'm calling the period that comes after that acute phase of grief, when we're really wondering how we're going to make it through every day without this person in our life. And then slowly, slowly, the intense pain starts to recede and we enter this next phase where we're adjusting and adapting to the loss constantly over time. And that's what I call the after grief. So I interviewed 81 people who had lost parents, siblings, close friends, or romantic partners, most of them before the age of 30. 
and then ask them how that kept showing up for them 10, 20, 30 years later. In my case, 39 years since my mother died and 16 years since my father died. And they're still a big part of my life. And I think of them all the time. And I miss them from time to time, sometimes very painfully still. It's, it's like it doesn't matter how much time has gone by. If you're missing something that you perceive to be so central to you, it never right. really goes away, right? I mean, does it? It doesn't really ever no. disappear. <laughs> I don't think so. And that's why I think that, you know, expecting things to last a certain amount of time or, or using measurements of time often backfires on us. I'm frequently asked, well, how long before I move from the acute face grieves into the after grief? You know, people want to have an idea like on what calendar date they're going to cross the threshold. And I can't answer that question for anybody. It's so individual. For some people, three months. For some people, six. For some people, two years. It depends on so many factors. But I think once we release ourselves from this idea that there's going to be an end point on the calendar and learn how to just move with the ebbs and the flows and think in terms of intensity and duration rather than an end point, it's a much, I think, much kinder and gentler way to move forward without someone important in our life. You point out so aptly that most employers give people maybe no time, maybe two weeks, and you you think you're supposed to be back on your feet. And of course, that's like impossible. Two weeks is nothing. It's like you can barely put your shoes on two weeks later. So... Oh, Zibi, the average is three days of paid leave. And three days, oh my gosh. That's the average for the American worker, three days of bereavement leave. And then you need to take paid leave or unpaid leave. I mean, I'm sorry, personal days, sick days, or if you have mental health days, maybe at your company, or you have to start going into paid time, unpaid time off in order to sufficiently mourn the person who died. And in many cultures, three days isn't even enough time to have the funeral because there are preparations and there are rituals that you need to go through. And so people are going into unpaid time off just in order to mourn their dead, which I, I think actually is a tragedy in this culture. Not to mention the fact that like you're so cognitively impaired when you're in the intense beginnings of grief for the most part, that the idea that you have to go through all that sludge and that, and then perform at work in like, as if you were at the top of your game is, is close to impossible. So it's almost not even, it's not even good practice for the companies to have employees who are like, you know, a fraction of themselves. If you just gave them a little more time, it might help. But anyway, I don't know why I'm even gotten into this. For some people, work is a really welcome distraction because they can compartmentalize really well. And then they feel like, okay, I can just leave that, you know, the the intense distress over here. I can go to work and get some relief and then come back. But not everybody can do that. And those who can't, I think shouldn't be expected to. You're right. You're absolutely right. No, I mean, work can be a total refuge. You had so many passages that I found so interesting. You wrote, a terrible disconnect exists between what the average person thinks grief should look and feel like, typically a series of progressive time-limited stages that end in a state of closure, and how grief, that artful dodger, actually behaves. This means a whole lot of people getting stuck in the gap between what they've been told to expect after someone dies and what they actually encounter when it happens. And I loved your expression the artful dodger so much that I like wrote it here in like blue sharpie because it's such a good description right it's something that like comes in and out and creeps it's like that creeping feeling and you don't know where it's going and it's so sneaky almost right well I'm also a child of the 70s and I grew up on Oliver yeah me too yeah yeah Yeah, me too. I knew I knew where I came from. <laughs> you know, a little boy with the black hair dancing in the streets of Dickensian in London. Yeah. I'm pretty sure my brother was the artful dodger in that play, but now I might be wrong, so forget mm-hmm. it. <laughs> you also wrote that mourners who are able to make meaning of their experiences exhibit lower levels of complicated grief and better mental and physical health later on. In fact, making meaning after trauma is the most powerful predictor of good long-term outcome among adults. So I wanted you just to discuss this notion of complicated grief versus whatever the opposite is, regular grief, well, and how... Well, yeah, go ahead. Complicated grief is a term that's used to describe about 15% of mourners who can't seem to get out of that acute phase of grief. You know, it's like the grief channel gets stuck on high or gets or gets stuck 24-7 and they're not able to, you know, compartmentalize and go to work and come back. They're at a high level of distress and can't turn the knob down. It's now believed that those are typically people who have pre-existing susceptibility to anxiety or depression. And that gets really amped up when somebody they love dies. 
but it is about 15% of the population. The rest of us kind of over time figure out how to adapt on our own. But I think there are still mourners needs. And I would even, you know, create like the mourners bill of rights, <laughs> things that we really need and deserve in order to adapt well on our own. Not everybody needs therapy and not everybody is a talker and needs to talk it out. But I think we all need some form of self-expression. We all need some sense of safety and, and security in order to grieve, which is why some people experience postponed or delayed grief. But complicated grief is a, a known category within the bereavement field, and it affects about 15% of people. And they really do need some professional assistance in order to work through whatever trauma they may have that's lingering or feelings of remorse or guilt or anxiety or depression that needs to be addressed concurrently with their bereavement needs. I'm actually surprised. I felt like the statistics on what percent of the population has anxiety or depression would make you think that far more than 15% would have complicated grief. Like, isn't, I can't remember, I don't know what the rates are off the top of my head, but I. We say complicated grief, and that's a term in the bereavement world to explain the people who are really at the highest level of distress and can't get out of it on their own. But I think everyone's grief is complicated. Totally. It can be complicated because you had a difficult relationship with that person. It can be complicated because you have children to take care of and you need to attend to their needs over losing a grandparent, for example, or a mom or a dad and don't have time to attend to your own. I think those are complications that can arise with grief. I know a number of people who have anxiety and depression can manage it on their own or are already managing it when grief comes, but this 15%, typically it just like, it's like the volume knob gets turned all the way up, like I said, and they're not able to turn it down on their own or with the assistance of the people they already have in, on their team. And you mentioned how much therapy and talking can help, but that obviously some people are not talkers. What if you have someone who ends up in the 15% who doesn't find talking helpful? What, how do you help that person if therapy doesn't help? Oh, I recommend that anyone in the 15% work with a bereavement professional or especially a trauma-informed bereavement professional if the loss was due to a traumatic form of death, like a suicide or a homicide or an accident that was disfiguring. Or sometimes, you know, really watching someone suffer for a long period of time is traumatic for us. There's something called shock trauma, which is when something happens very suddenly and unexpectedly, but there's also a category called strain trauma, which is taking care of someone or watching someone who's ill deteriorate over a long period of time. But so I would recommend almost anyone in the 15% who feels like they might not be able to, and you know, they can do decide, is it that for six weeks they are they are too sad to get out of bed? I mean, that's serious, right? Or is it six months later they still can't concentrate at work because they're still having images or flashbacks about how the loved one died? Those might be examples of complicated grief. But I think that anyone needs a form, everyone needs a form of self-expression and it doesn't have to be talking. Some of us are talkers and we don't have anyone who'll listen. <laughs> but people shut us down. They don't want to hear, especially months later. You know, they feel like we should be over it, which is why the introduction to the book is called Getting Over, Getting Over It, because I think we just have to get past this idea as a culture that grief is something we get over. But forms of artistic expression or physical activities are also terrific ways to externalize our feelings, whether we're doing it through, you know, cardio or we're doing it through dance or writing. You know, writing is known to be, and journaling is known to be a really excellent way of helping people release and process the emotions that come with grief. I think reading too, helping, you know, I know it's more of like a receptive type of act versus, you know, productive, but I think taking in other people's stories and sort of having that make in your head sort of make sense with your own can help. I think so. I think that's why, you know, certain book clubs can be really helpful if people are, you know, really responding to the material or reading a book like The After Grief and then talking about it with somebody. That's bibliotherapy and a form of talk therapy. You just need a compassionate other that you can confide in. It's really important, really, really important. All the research shows that, and, and this was one of the most fascinating things I learned when I wrote this book. It was a, a subset of social psychology, and it's also a form of psychology called constructive psychology. It's about how we make sense of the world around us, and this is how we make meaning. But we do it by creating a story that tells what happened and 
that makes sense to us. And sometimes that's hard when someone dies if we don't know all the facts or we don't really understand what happened or why, or we weren't there to witness it and we have to piece it together from other people's accounts. That can take a while, but we need to create a story that makes sense to us emotionally and cognitively. And there's something called the story development phase after a death where the survivors piece together the story to make sense of it. And oftentimes we find that even within a family, members don't have the same story to explain what happened. And they may make a different meaning out of the loss as a result. And we see that a lot when a parent dies and siblings have different stories about what happened and what it meant to them and what it means to the family as a whole. But after you create that story, you really need to be able to tell it in some way, whether it's writing it out as a memoir or putting it in your journal or talking to a friend or talking about it in therapy. The confiding part of story development is extremely important. Psychologists have found for people's adjustment over time that you have to be able to share that story in some way, whether it's with one person or the public at large. Maybe this is why I like post on Instagram all the time when I'm going through grief. I'm like so mortified by it now, but I'm like, I like, that's how I process everything. And I know I'm not alone in that. So <laughs> I think social media gives us an opportunity to confide. And even if we're doing it with, you know, a long list of strangers, we are still putting it out there in the world in some way and getting some feedback. I was also so interested in your book that you went back to the women who you had interviewed years and years ago for your motherless daughter's first book. And I I loved the image of you like rooting through files and being like, well, who can I, who can I Google and find information about at this point? So you reunited with, I think you said something like 20 or 14 or something like that of the original crew and then interviewed them along with other people. What did you, what were your main findings? Well, that was something else. I felt like the Edelman PI firm for a while yeah. trying, to, <laughs> trying to track down these women because it had been 27 years since I had first interviewed them for motherless daughters. So, you know, a lot of their last names had changed. They'd gotten married or they'd gotten divorced. A few of them had passed away. Some of them I just, you know, couldn't locate, but I did manage through, and it wasn't really that sophisticated, to be honest. My private investigating firm was not really that high level, but it was mostly, you know, like Google and white pages and Facebook and LinkedIn and a couple of the women I had kept in touch with over the years. But see, I was really young. I was 28 years old, living in New York. This was before the internet. I found these people by putting an ad in the back of the Village Voice or word of mouth. I traveled to a couple other cities. And so these women had now dispersed all over the world 27 years later. But I had sat down with them one-on-one and taped the interviews. And some of the interviews went on for, you know, two, three, four hours, really extensive in-depth interviews. And then I had used portions of it in the book and, you know, kept in touch with some of them after the book came out. They were all pseudonyms in the book. And I could not find, when I was writing The After Grief, any studies that had tracked people over decades, also to see how their stories had changed and evolved. Because when I say we make a story of the loss to make sense of it, that story, it's always in motion, right? It's always in a state of evolution. We're going to reach a point in our own development later where we're going to look back at those same set of facts and we might see them differently. Or new information might come in, or we might meet someone that tells us something about our loved one that we didn't know that maybe changes our perspective a bit. And so I was really interested, how do stories change over time, stories of loss? And there weren't any studies, no studies tracked people longer than about seven years at the most. And that's because it's expensive to have a study that lasts that long. It, you know, the, it's hard to keep participants in it for that long. There are all kinds of scientific reasons why those studies would be difficult to maintain. But I couldn't find anything that tracked people over decades. And then I remembered, oh, I have all these transcripts of interviews from and tapes from these interviews that I did with the original motherless daughters. There were, I think, 94 of them. And I managed to find about 18, pretty without doing too much work, you know, a couple days up to weeks of searching for them. And so I located 18 of them and were able to reach them through emails or through LinkedIn or through Facebook. And I think 17 of them agreed to be re-interviewed. And so I reconnected with a number of them in person because they still lived in New York. I flew out to New York and I sat down with them again, 27, 28 years later. 
and the rest of them by Skype or FaceTime, always seeing each other. And it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary to see each other again after all this time. I learned that their stories were very dynamic. Obviously, they changed a lot. Most of these women had been in their 20s and 30s when I first spoke with them. So now they had had very rich and full lives. They'd been married. Some of them had been divorced. They were, some of them had children or they were single moms. A number of them had lost their fathers as well by that point or had other major losses in their lives. But I said, just as I had the first time, I'm just going to ask you to tell me your story of mother loss. Start wherever you'd like and tell me the story. And the second time I said, as if we've never talked before. I want to see what your story looks like now or sounds like now. And I asked the same kinds of questions I had the first time, but not leading questions. I was just, you know, asking them to fill in some parts of it, you know, that I thought could be flushed out more. And then we sat down together or, you know, both of us separate, well, separately, but together, looked at the original transcript and looked at the one that came several decades later. And it was really fascinating to see which parts of the story that had been so important to them when they were younger, didn't even show up in the later version. And which parts did show up almost verbatim because it it had been important parts that they'd been telling over the years so that they were telling it exactly the same way. But what really struck me, Zibi, was how many of them talked about that first interview as a watershed moment in their story. Hmm. And I think it was for many of them the first time they had been able to confide in someone because they had been carrying a story for all these years and people had told them you should be over it by now or you know it's in the past don't don't wallow don't dwell and family members maybe didn't want them to talk about it or had silenced them in some cases you know very deliberately and so it was the first time that someone said i want to hear your story and i want to hear all of it and i'm going to give you hours to tell it and Quite a few of them said that interview was a real turning point for me. It was when I feel like my healing really advanced or in some cases really began because somebody wanted to hear it and I didn't have to carry it alone anymore. Wow. I mean, that must have made you feel really good. It did, but those all those interviews helped me as much as they helped them because I was on the same journey that they were. So I was as thankful to all of them as they were to me because those original interviews were really very more of a conversation than a, you know, a Q&A. So if there's somebody who has recently lost a mother, say in the last five years, knowing what you have researched about the after grief, like what can they expect in 20 some odd years? You can expect that there will be certain moments when that loss feels almost fresh and new and painful again. And that's because they might be experiencing it in a new way. There's a category of grief that I identified in this book that I call new old grief. And that's when we experience an old loss in a new way. And we can't grieve the loss of the person in this capacity until we get there. So for example, I was 17 when my mom died and I was 33 when my first daughter was born. There was absolutely no way I could grieve my mother's absence as a grandmother or as a resource to me as a new mom when I was 17. I couldn't even have those emotions when I was pregnant with my daughter, although I felt them coming. I really could only miss her that way and understand what she had lost when my daughter was there in my arms, healthy. And it was 16 years after my mom had died. I had thought, oh gosh, you know, even after all the work I'd done, I thought you'd think that I, you know, more than anyone wrote this book, have been traveling the world talking about mother loss, that I would have a handle on this. And it turned out, that no, I was not different from anybody else. I was still mourning the loss of my mom as a new mom in a way that I couldn't before because, and, and then another big one, and this is a big transition for women too, is when you reach and pass the age your mother was when she died. Because if your mom died young, most of us are going to do that. And I've you know, worked with women. I'm also a grief and loss coach. So I've worked with clients whose moms died when they were 29. 35. You know, my mom was 42. This is, this is young. So 42 was a really wonky year for me because I was like, wow, I'm as old as my mom was. And when I was 17, she seemed so old and 42 is not very old. And then I turned 43 and that was like, whoa, I'm older than my mom. Got to be, you know, so my inner relationship with her and my inner representation of her really needed to shift, especially as I, you know, got even older. And then I'm sort of looking back at her 
And so I think women who have lost their moms just a few years ago can be aware that that's ahead. But I'm creating resources and there are resources that exist. And I'm actually working with people now who help create rituals to offer free templates for a way to honor reaching your mom's age and passing it. And also for acknowledging death anniversaries every year, particularly significant ones like the 1st, the 10th, the 20th, almost like wedding anniversaries. We have ways to acknowledge wedding anniversaries, like a 25th wedding anniversary. But we don't have any way to acknowledge, wow, my dad or my mom has been gone for 20 years. That's a long time. I want to do something. I don't know what. There's nothing in the culture that, you know, we can do. Some, if you have, you know, a culture within American culture, there may be some kind of ritual that you, your family might perform, like a Day of the Dead celebration or ceremony. Or if you're Jewish, you can light a candle. But there really is, you know, once we're done with a funeral in American culture, there really isn't a whole lot of ritual for us to connect with, to maintain those connections and to bind the past, the present and the future for a sense of continuity and allow that person to walk forward with us in a meaningful way. And so I know there are a number of initiatives happening now, especially in the COVID era, to help people through these transitions. And my hope is that they will extend to the larger culture over time. I hope so. I feel like there's such a lack. You're so right. And it would just, I mean, everybody at some point or another, you, I mean, not, I guess maybe not every single person, but almost every single person goes through losing somebody at some point in their lives. And yet there's not that much. I mean, there are experts like you and there are obviously books on grieving and things like that, but that's not enough, right? You Like your message, the, uh, your ability to scale it is so important. And like having things be a part of life as opposed to like, we all know, okay, we go to a memorial service, like then what? Like there should be more, there should be for a hundred percent more goalposts and, and ways that the community can help you too. I think in COVID and I think I, I'm not sure if I mentioned an email, but we lost my mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law both within six weeks this summer. So, oh. so I have my, you know, my husband who's 38 and my sister-in-law who's 33. We've all, you know, they've been living with the kids and me this whole time. And we've been sort of going through this process together. And there's no, especially in COVID times, there's no community that you can be a part of, right? It's all virtual or, you know, maybe, you know, an aunt, a cousin will check in on text, but it's not like what you had before. So, and there are so many, many, many people who are going through this right now, not just for COVID, but in so many ways. So what would you say to that? Not my story you know, yeah. itself, but just like the probably millions of people who can't be with somebody who's, who's grieving or who feels they're doing it more or less alone. Yeah. Right. I know this is so important right now. It's really important. You know, 120 years ago, grieving was a social phenomenon. People came together, like the village gathered to mourn the passing of one of their own. And our facsimile of that now that has, you know, has, has survived 120 years of Western culture is the funeral and the eulogy and the memorial service. And in some cases, the celebration of life. And it doesn't extend much beyond the event itself, but it's something because it brings people together and they sit and they share, they listen to stories and they share stories and they even laugh, you know, about, about warm and funny memories that, that they can share. When it's much harder to do that now. I think the Zoom funerals and Zoom memorials don't really fulfill the need that especially the mourners have for human companionship and human touch. But that said... They do offer an opportunity for people who can't physically get to a funeral to still be part of the village. People who can't afford to fly on short notice or can't leave children or can't leave work and otherwise would not be able to take part in the ritual. So my hope is that we get back to in-person gatherings and memorials as soon as we can, as soon as it's safe, but that we also live stream them so that the people who can't make it can still be part of that village and the village is more expansive because our villages now are dispersed. You know, they're not all in the same geographic perimeter. Our villages are spread out all over the world in some cases. And so we want to find a way to bring them together. But people have asked me, you know, or said, we've had to postpone the funeral or memorial for our loved one who died. And, and not just to COVID, because people are dying of all other causes as well, right, in the past nine months. But they say, you know, they've said to me, well, what do you think? You know, it may be another year before we can do it. And I said, doesn't matter. Where's the law that says the celebration of life has to occur 
within the first week or two after a death or the first month. There really is no written guideline that said, or mandate that says we have to do it within a certain period of time. Again, I think we have to let go of our idea of the, the calendar structure and say, we'll do it when we can. And it's really important. And I say, if you can't do it for another two years, people are still going to remember your loved one. They're still going to have stories of the person who died. And we're going to find out what it means to us to come together a year or two later instead of doing it right after. And we might find in some ways that it's actually richer and more meaningful. I don't know because we haven't tried it yet. But I think it's really important that we do it no matter how long we have to wait. It would be nice if like each year on the anniversary of the birthday or the death or something that, that there was, you know, an event or something that marked it, not just for you, but anyway, I think it's great all you're advocating for and, <laughs> and all the rest. Tell me a little more about your work as an author on top of a researcher and coach and grief counselor. Now you're doing all these live seminars, right? I saw on Instagram, you have a new six week course or something coming up. Well, tell me a little bit about that. And then also when it is you managed to fit all of this into your life. Oh, well, okay. So I do offer online courses and online support groups now. And this is a kind of an offshoot of the retreats that I was leading in person. Claire Bidwell-Smith, author, therapist, friend of yours. And I, in 2016, started offering live retreats for motherless daughters who really wanted to meet other women who could understand their experiences as adults. And we started in Ojai, California with 23 women. And that grew into a whole company that I'm now moving forward and 13 retreats have been done, one of them virtually, 12 of them in person. We do ones for women who were children and teenagers when their moms died. I've done one for women who were just in their 20s, a couple for women who were adults when their moms died, because the needs of those groups are very different. But when COVID came, I started moving into more online offerings. So yes, I do offer some online courses. I also do individual and group coaching. How do I fit it in? Well, my kids are older now. It would have been almost impossible to do it when they were younger at this level because not having had a mom after the age of 17, I was really committed to being a mom who was present and gave my kids a, as much of me as possible. But they're now 23 and almost 19. My youngest one just started college in September. So I'm able to dive more fully into these kinds of offerings. And it just happened to coincide with COVID and this incredible need for grief awareness and grief education and grief advocacy. So it is a little bit of being at the right place at the right time, or maybe I should say the right place at the wrong time, because nobody would have wanted to think of COVID as the right time, of course. But there's a, an expanded need for this work, and I'm just trying to fill those gaps. Excellent. Um, do you have any advice I'm going to ask two, two questions. Any advice to aspiring authors, particularly of your type of work that involves a lot of research and sort of more analytical thinking mixed with memoir, and also to those who have a relationship with grief that they continue to wrestle with? Mm, okay. Well, in terms of writing, and you're right, I do, this book is a high, I write straight memoir too, mm -hmm. short pieces long form as well. But this book is a hybrid. This book integrates my own story with research. So I became in a way sort of someone who tried to decode my own experience and understand it. And also, so it combines research interview and personal writing. I find it difficult to maintain a really solid writing schedule. And so I binge write. I'll go away for four or five days and I'll take everything else off my calendar and I will just write in those. That's how I've written most of my books. I've just had to binge write them. And same thing for this book. This book, the majority of this book was written between February and June of this year because COVID took everything else off my schedule. And I just sat down at my dining room table day after day after day and worked on the book. I can multitask like a ninja, but I can't always, you know, focus on writing to the extent that I need to if I've got three or four other things going on. So I tell people, you know, whatever works for you. If you read that Stephen King gets up every morning at 5 a.m. and writes for four hours and you feel somehow less than because you can't do that, don't worry. I mean, my circadian rhythm is to write late at night. I do my best writing like between 5 and 10 p.m. 
So I can do all my administrative tasks during the day and then write between five and 10. Or like I said, I just go away and binge write. Again, it's a matter of finding what works for you. And when my kids were young, I couldn't, you know, always go away for four or five days. But occasionally I was able to negotiate with my husband at the time that he could take the kids from like, he'd pick them up from school on Friday. And so I would leave, I would drop them at school Friday morning and I'd take off. There was a hotel in Ventura, California, an hour and 15 minutes away, which was just far enough away that I could get home easily in case of emergency, but they would not be dropping by for dinner if the kids were crying that they missed me. So it was like the perfect distance and they knew me there, you know, oh, she's back, the writer's back. And I went like one weekend every six weeks, maybe from a Friday morning until a Sunday at like three o'clock, I got a late checkout. And I would just bring food into the room and eat all my meals there and just sit at the desk and write. And that's how I wrote Motherless Mothers back in 2000. That came out in 2006. So my kids were five and nine when that book came out. So they were probably like four and eight when I was doing those weekends there. And that's what worked for me. And you know, now I have more time to write, but other more responsibilities. Your other question was about people who were having trouble with their grief. Yeah, Is that it? just still like, trying to get a handle on it. Well, there's no right, right or wrong way to grieve. There's only your way to grieve. And if someone says, I'm having trouble with grief, I first ask them, what are your expectations of what grief should look like and what it should be? And let's sort of deconstruct those at first and see if you're holding yourself to a standard that maybe isn't one that you can meet for various reasons. You know, a lot of people, especially men, think they're not, they haven't grieved because they haven't had these outward displays of emotion that we normally associate with grief. And some women too have said to me, I don't feel like I cried enough. I don't think I grieved my, my person. Or someone says to me, I never grieved, you know, the death of my mom or dad when I was young. And I said, well, what do you mean by you never grieved it? And they say, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't cry enough. And so we want to look at that. But I say, I firmly believe that we all grieve to the best of our ability at any point in time. And maybe at that point in time, your ability was very limited because you didn't feel safe or you didn't have, if you were a child, you didn't have adults around you to help support you in your grief. Or maybe you had other survival needs that were more pressing at that moment and you couldn't focus on your own emotions because you were taking care of other people. Or you couldn't, you know, you had a demanding job that had to support your family. But men often say to me that they feel they didn't grieve because they didn't cry. And in fact, there's so much more research now about the difference between how men and women grieve. And I see this among spouses, I see it among partners and siblings. They don't really understand each other because men don't typically have these, or the masculine way of grieving, I should say, because about 15 to 20% of women grieve in a more masculine style and 15 to 20% of men grieve in a more feminine style. But the feminine style is reaching out, talking, emoting, showing your emotions. And the male grief patterns are more about working through your feelings by doing, which is why some cultures have the women sit in a room with other women and cry for days in a row and have the men plan the funeral because working through the details for the men is a way that they are processing their emotions around grief. Men tend to want to fix things or solve problems and work through their grief that way. And women don't always recognize that that's what the men are doing. And men often don't understand why the women can't pull things together and be more, you know, instrumental and need to talk about it all the time. It's just different patterns of grieving, but they're both working through their feelings of loss. Wow. Well, Hope, thank you so much for chatting today. I'm going to share your episode far and wide for those many people out there who need it. And thank you for all the research and the personal stories and everything that went into the after grief and for creating this concept so that people who are continuing to be sad for the rest of their lives know that there's a reason why and they're not doing anything wrong. So, And this, I just want to also emphasize, this doesn't mean you're going to be grieving for the rest of your life. It just means you're going to be remembering and thinking about and occasionally missing that person because they were really important to you and they will continue to be important to you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for Audible sponsoring this episode. Get your amazing deal, $4.95 for six months, for your first six months for their holiday Audible Plus offer. Go to audible.com slash Zibby or text Zibby to 500-500. Thanks, Audible. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. 
Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 